This morning, this lesson is, frankly, it's a bit unusual, and I hope that you kind of bear with me as we present some things that I think of a unique nature. This young lady's name is Cassidy Aspen Cochran, and she was born on June 22nd, 1994. I don't know that you can read this, but I'm going to read to you, sadly, her obituary. She was a precocious child. As soon as she could talk, she was quoting lines from Shakespeare. She loved to perform for friends and family. She called herself the queen of make-believe. She was so smart, so funny, even when times got tough, she could always make you laugh. She had a huge heart. She loved animals, all animals. She was so beautiful, stunning really. She recently had plans to marry her fiance, Frank Calzone. She loved him and he loved her. She wanted to create a life with him. She seemed genuinely happy over this past year with him. Unfortunately, Cassidy also struggled with addiction. Her addiction finally won. She died of a heroin overdose in the early morning hours of November the 11th, 2016. We write this not to dishonor her memory, but to shine some light on an illness that is taking the lives of far too many. If we allow shame, guilt, or embarrassment to cause this illness to become a dark family secret hiding in the shadows, Everyone loses. Cassidy now joins the ever-expanding list of daughters, sons, sisters, brothers, and grandchildren taken far too soon by this growing health care epidemic. But please remember, Cassidy isn't just a statistic. She was our sunshine, even when she kept us awake with worry. Everyone on that list was the light of someone's life. Thus, it is important to remember that Cassidy wasn't just her illness. She was our daughter and our friend. Words cannot describe how much she will be missed. This is the obituary that was in the newspaper in Birmingham that can be seen online that was prepared by her family as they suffered with the loss of their daughter. You see, they were wanting to get a message out. There's a problem in our land. Recently, there had been more than one article in the Christian Chronicle, and if someone's saying, what's that? It's kind of like a newspaper for Churches of Christ. And one of the articles began with this headline, The Addiction Battle in Our Pews. And this particular article highlighted Brandon Holt, who had worked as a minister, as a preacher. And as you see here, it says, speaking out of his own tragedy, Brandon Holt Sr. is gaining national recognition as he educates churches and leaders on the realities of substance use disorders. Holt's struggles began while he was working as a senior minister in Corona, California. He was in a car accident that required back surgery, triggering an addiction to pain medication, a condition that plagues more than two million people in the U.S., according to the National Institute on Drug Abuse. As Holt rapidly decompensated, his family left him His church fired him, and his mortgage company foreclosed on him. And all of this, he says, I was preaching every Sunday, visiting the sick, attending leadership meetings, baptizing souls, counseling, yet secretly battling for my life. Another article in that same paper The leprosy in my neighborhood is addiction. As someone talks about their work in their particular neighborhood, 
and how they're trying to fight this trouble of addiction. That's the lesson this morning. It's to be on addiction. And quite frankly, I've never preached on this subject. And as someone says, well, how is it a Bible subject? We're going to see some things in just a moment. Marvin Daniel, though, had some words to say to me. He said it looked like an interesting outline. But then he noticed what we'd be speaking about or bringing attention to, and he says, back in my day, or back when he was young, he said that sermons would be about addiction to tobacco, Coca-Cola, and coffee. Well, those can certainly be addictions, but we would recognize as well there's other addictions that are plaguing our society worse than ever. Addiction. It's about like, well, it's about like being chained, being enslaved. Now, anytime I take a subject, I want to say, well, what does the Bible say about it? And I'm going to, if nothing else, I wanted to see that word, that main word of the subject. And so I thought, well, the word addiction. And I looked up addict, addicted, and addiction. And in the Living Oracles, that's Alexander Campbell's translation of the New Testament, you find it one time where in the last part of Acts 7 22, it says, addicted to the worship of demons. Then you find the word just one time in the King James Version, in 1 Corinthians 16, 15. And there, thankfully, the word addicted is in a positive sense. Addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. And frankly, I wish that everyone here would be addicted to what's good and right and honorable and godly. Then we find another translation, English Standard Version. Just one time it's found there, and that with regards to the qualifications of deacons, not addicted to much wine in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. So this word itself, uh, addict, addiction, addicted, frankly, some translations have it not at all, and some translations just one time. But there's some ideas, I think, that clearly make you think of addiction. In Romans chapter 6, verse 16, you read there, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. So here's kind of this idea of, you know, you become enslaved. It's either sin or it's goodness. But that's almost like an addiction, isn't it? You find in John 8, 34, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. Once again, this idea of a slave to sin is almost like, almost like an addiction. But there's two principles I would suggest to you that are very clearly saying, listen, Watch out for what would be addictive. One, look at 1 John 5, 21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now someone might say, I don't see addiction in that verse. Hold on a minute. Now how have we so oftentimes defined idols? I remember as a small child sitting in a Bible class hearing a teacher say, anything that becomes between you and God, that's an idol. Even in the last just two or three weeks, I think I've heard somebody define idol in that fashion. Whatever comes between you and God, and you could be sure of this, those addictions that we're going to make mention of shortly, they are things that truly have come between that person and God. It's become their idol. Now, of course, addictions and idols are not limited to these few things we're going to make mention of. In preparation for this, I was trying to kind of just kind of get some material in mind, and I saw this lesson one pe person preached on addiction. He says, everybody in here, raise your hand if you know someone that's got an addiction. Every hand, I think, went up. I think, frankly, if I were to say, everybody in here, if you know someone that's suffering from an addiction, I think every hand would go up. But then he said, okay, now, for all of you who are suffering from addiction, raise your hand. ha. <laughs> No, not many went up. 
His lesson went on to talk about addiction from just a very, very kind of general, uh, generalization of how things can kind of overtake us. I'm going to be a little bit more specific today. But this passage, I think, has something to say about addiction. But I think 1 Thessalonians 5.22 also has something to say about addiction. Abstain from every form of evil. Now, as we're going to look at a few of these, I guess you could say, substances of which people are addicted to, and you see the fruits of it, you're going to have to say, that's evil. And Paul says, you abstain from every form of evil. You know, as I said, if you know of someone who has suffered from addiction, raise your hand. I personally think probably every hand would go up. I couldn't help but be touched reading the obituary that the parents placed in a newspaper online, the daughter. But I also remember it wasn't so many years ago that I saw one commercial after another after another of Carol O'Connor. You remember him? The last, I guess, show that he did, it was on TV for years, and now there's the reruns in the heat of a night about kind of a police sheriff's office over in the state of Mississippi. And through many of those years, his son was one of the actors in that show. And his son died of a drug overdose. And Carol O'Connor made those commercials, and he basically was saying, you get between your children and drugs any way you can. And you know that he had tried. He truly meant it, as he had lost a child to an addiction. First thing we're going to make mention of today is opioids. You see this in the news so often. It would be anything from the illegal heroin to prescription drugs. Heroin, opium, yes, that'd be opioids, but illegally. But then there's the prescription drugs of morphine, codeine, fentanyl, and uh, kind of the generics, hydrocodone, oxycodone. Prescription names like Oxycontin or Percocet, Percodan, Vicodin. And let's just say this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's what we're talking about when we're talking about opioids. And you're seeing it in the news constantly. Opioids, opioids, opioids. Why? Well, because here's just one statistic. Jefferson County, Alabama, couldn't find anything about Montgomery. Record 248 drug overdose deaths in 2016. 12% increase over the previous year of those 205 involved heroin, fentanyl, or a combination of both. And then later on it mentions, well, deaths from prescription opioids. In other words, the majority of the deaths were from the opioids, showing how dangerous they are. And if we say how commonplace are they in use, we could say this would be one reason possibly for the addiction, albeit Many of these, of course, prescribed in the proper manner and as needed. The 5.8 million opioid prescriptions were written in 2015. And we say, well, how many is that for the state of Alabama? That's a 1.2 prescriptions for every Alabamian, which I frankly think is incredible when you realize the vast majority of people didn't get a prescription for opioids, for those painkillers. And so it's saying that a number of people have received a whole lot of prescriptions. This, just this past week, I've been thinking about this lesson for a while. Wasn't quite sure exactly what do I do with it. It's not the typical lesson I would preach. And there in the newspaper, just a little bitty blurb at the very bottom, talking about Montgomery Advertiser. This is this Tuesday. Heroin death skyrocket. Fatal overdoses resulted the heroin rose 533% from 2,089 cases in 2002 to 13,219 
in 2016. Of course, this would be nationwide, not merely Alabama. But it shows how the opioid and opioid addiction and heroin, particularly that illegal substance, is becoming a greater and greater plague on our country. Opioids killed more than 33,000 people in the United States in 2015. That's close to as many deaths caused by traffic crashes that same year, according to federal statistics. Nearly half of all opioid overdose deaths involved a prescription drug. And of opioids, 78 people die each day overdosing on painkillers. Now, just say this. Yes, for just a moment, we've highlighted the substance abuse, the addiction to opioids. But I think we'd all recognize that's not the only drug out there. When I was a kiddo, um, and we'd have a class in school, and drugs were mentioned, and heroin would be a part of that mix, but kind of like... It's not really around here. That's in those big cities like New York City. Well, it's come. It's local. And it's a problem. But it is the case that's not the only drug. And that's not the only drug killing people. It's just the increase in that has been so very dramatic. And heroin because, well, it started out with the prescription opioids, the painkillers, Maybe couldn't get him anymore. Maybe the doctor got arrested. That was giving me all those big prescriptions. So now what happens? The person turns to, to what? Turns to that illegal, sometimes even cheaper source of opioid, heroin. But other drugs? This is startling. 40 million people in the U.S., that's to say one in seven age 12 and older, have a substance abuse problem. That's scary, isn't it? One in seven. And you can't really see this very good. I realize that, but you see that line starts off and goes <laughs> higher and higher and higher. You see around 64,000 th- 64, people died from drug overdoses in the U.S. in 2016. That's not just opioids, that's all of them. 64,000 people. And if we're going to say, well, just how many people is that? Well, that next line says, the peak car crash deaths in a year. It was 1972, and that'd be up there towards, you know, 50,000 or so. But in other words, more than that. The next is down there is, is the peak in HIV deaths. It was back in about, I can't even see that very good, 1995 maybe, and that would have been a little above 40,000, maybe 45,000 deaths. And then below that, there's this line that says peak gun deaths. And that was in the 1990s as well. It's less than 40,000. And so we are talking about more deaths from drug abuse than other kind of headline-grabbing things that cause deaths. And now it's become that overdoses are the leading cause of death of Americans under the age of 50. I just have to say this to you. All that's got to say this. Don't you see the evil of it? And so yes, it's a Bible subject. Abstain from every form of evil. And kind of a by the way, how do, you, how do you keep from being an addict? You never, you never start. You never take that first hit. You never take that first try. You never have that first experience. There's never any experimenting. And then you never have the drug abuse problem. A second, oh, you don't hear about it quite as much now, alcohol. It's kind of like the opioids or the drug of the day that we're concerned about. Of course, there's been such an increase, but once again, if I said, how many people know somebody that's had trouble with alcohol addiction? I've, I've preached to, I call it that, preach a funeral. I've preached two funerals where... One of the persons, he had died in intensive care. 
He had destroyed his liver and his kidneys. His body then collected, swelled up with fluids, and just basically his skin was cracking and he was oozing before he died. And how did he get to that point? Beer drinking. It was beer. That was his choice of alcohol. He drank a lot of it and a lot of years. But that's why he was in that casket. Another time, it was kind of a little different, but it was someone high on drugs and alcohol, then doing the deeds they were doing, and that's how they were killed. There'd never been no drugs, no alcohol. Wouldn't have been that funeral. Alcoholism is one of the most common addictions affecting Americans. 16.6 million people with alcoholism. And there are approximately, this gets me, 3 million teenagers that are addicted to alcohol and half of all teenagers that try alcohol will become heavy users of it. Tim, were, Tim and I were, I call us bottle washers. Chief Cook was Ted. We were the bottle washers at the ladies' retreat. We were the cleanup crew. We, we talked some over the last three days about addiction. And, and, I, and I asked him about, you know, his long Navy career and about maybe alcohol abuse in the Navy. And, and of course, it was there. But then he told me... A, one of the more notable ones. He said, the guy was just 18 years old. And he was an alcoholic. And had been since he was 14 years old. That statistic is shocking to me. Maybe it's all too real. Another shocking, and I just, I don't want to believe this. About 80% of college students drink alcohol heavily, which leads to the deaths of 1,825 students annually. You know, this is kind of documented, and this is what supposedly are real statistics, and I want to put my head in the sand and say, no, it's not that bad. Alcohol. Once again, another addictive substance that... It leads to death. Nearly 88,000 people, men and women, more men than women, die from alcohol-related causes annually, making it the third leading preventable cause of death in the United States. And in 2012, one person died in an alcohol-related car crash every 51 minutes. Now, you know when you see all this, you have to walk away and say, listen, now, the Bible has some things to say about alcohol, and it's not good, okay? We're not taking the time to study all of that. There's not time. I'm going to go over and just say for that, I'm sorry. But you cannot help but see the evil when you see the trouble it causes within lives. And once again, I think everybody here has probably known somebody who's messed up their life and maybe lost their life. From alcohol, from alcohol. But next, gambling addiction. Gambling addiction. Yeah, gambling addiction. Yeah, it's different. It's different than the opioids. It's different than the alcohol. But yet they say what it kind of does to the brain, you might say the science of addiction, is kind of similar. And, you know, this is surprising who sometimes it can be. One of the ladies at the retreat this past week, a friend of Tish and I, we've known her a few years, was speaking to her and had a difficult time because her sister-in-law had recently died. They had to travel, different state, kind of help with affairs. She didn't have, a, never married, didn't have children. And then she said and spoke of the debts it was all because of gambling. This lady, in her 70s, an addiction to gambling. Okay, that's not the lady. That's just a stock picture. 
Australia. Okay, this isn't unique to us. One of their electronic games is called Pokey. And you know, here's a headline of an article. Australia's Pokey Plague. It's not just here in America, you see. And so, you know, here you have it. We're clamoring for legalized gambling, and yet all the while you've got these organizations warning us about compulsive gambling, giving us hotlines that we can call to help us if we've got a problem. Just this very morning, we turn on Channel 12, and there's this little program, then the Today Show comes on, and while we're getting ready, we kind of hear a little bit of the news. And what was one of the commercials this morning? Giving you the number if you've got a gambling problem. And you know, even isn't this so sweet? Wind Creek, you know what that is? Wind Creek is calling attention to the gambling problem. Of course, they want to refer to responsive gambling. But then they, they will acknowledge there's a gambling problem. Problem gambling, it says, is gambling behavior that causes disruption in a person's life and can be mental, physical, social, and or work-related. Problem gambling includes a progressive addiction characterized by increasing preoccupation with gambling, a need to bet more money more frequently, restlessness or irritability when attempting to stop, Chasing losses and loss of control and continued gambling in spite of serious negative consequences. And I just say this, yeah, I'm surprised sometimes at the people who are doing the gambling. But it's kind of like the alcohol, the drugs. Nobody ever took their first, whether it was some kind of illegal substance or whether it was the first drink or whether they first placed their first bet. They never thought in terms of this will ruin my life. You know this, had they never done it, would not have ruined their life. Alabama Council on Compulsive Gambling says nearly 1% of the general population in Alabama has a gambling problem. And then it says Alabama has the highest number per capita of sports betting in the entire United States. Hmm, are they betting on Alabama or Auburn? And I'll say that jokingly. The reality is, could it start with a sports bet and just move on from there? And, and originally somebody thought, oh, it's so innocent. But yet, 1% of the population has trouble with it. When you don't know when to say no, you spend money that you cannot afford to lose. And you have to lie to other people to cover up your gambling activity. Money's the drug of choice for problem gamblers. And once again, you know, you have to walk away and say, oh yes, we could have a sermon on gambling. We've had them in the past. But what I'm wanting just to see, yes, it's become that idol. It's become between the person and God. It's, it's, it's evil. And abstain from every form of evil. Pornography addiction. Many, many years ago, I'm guessing probably 25 years ago, I ordered some books, and I got the books in the mail, and then there was a book in there that says, uh, we had these, they were damaged, so we're sending them out as kind of a complimentary uh, copy. And the title of the book was The Porno Plague. Porno Plague. In other words, the whole book was about about the trouble and problem of pornography in the United States of America. That was like 25 years ago. And just to put it bluntly, if it was a problem then, it's, and yes it is, an extraordinary problem today. Barna Group in the U.S. in 2014, and Barna tends to be reliable statisticians. They had the following percentage of men that said they view pornography at least once a month. 18 to 30 year olds, 79%. 31 to 49 year olds, 67%, 50 to 68 year olds, 25%. Then women, it's less, but still, I just say this, to a great extent, I have to say shockingly high with all of this. And we say, how accurate is it? Well, once again, I say, Barna tends to be pretty reliable, trusted statisticians. But what, do you, what would you have to say once again? Here we see idolatry, here we see evil. 
And once again, if you never got started, there would never be a problem. Now, I just threw this in. I saw this while I was looking and studying about addiction, that one in ten young people who plays video games has an addiction. So, you know, I'm just pointing that out, just kind of like, we could have talked about all kinds of things. And yes, people can be addicted to all kinds of things. So let me just say this, regarding whatever we choose in our lives, recognize I must never, never, ever, even if it could be good and right within itself, let it come between me and God, be that idol. Never take it to a place that it becomes a form of evil. You know, the scope of this lesson was primarily to bring attention to the problem. But just in quick, in closing, how do we overcome addiction? How do we overcome addiction? And, and these things I've placed here are so simplistic. I'm, I'm not suggesting that this is it and it's easy. I'm just suggesting here's a starting place. And there is that starting place of you admit an addiction problem. Nobody ever gets help unless they will acknowledge they've got the problem. Then we'd have to say this, repent. I have an idea that those who would finally get to the point of admitting it have within their mind, I want to stop. Recently, somebody told me about a family member, though, that was an alcoholic. Started young, drank, drank heavily, and then finally it, it killed them. And he says, I wonder at what point he got to that he knew, I can't stop. And I kind of thought, too, I can't stop and this is going to kill me. Repentance is making up your mind. In the sense of all this substance abuse or addictions, to stop. You know, there's got to be that intention of heart. And then next, I just say this, know you're in the battle for your very life. These kinds of things we discussed this morning, they kill. And they destroy if they don't kill. And so, yes, you be in the battle for your life to overcome. But then last, and if somebody were going to say, which of these would be one of the most important? Well, you know, I don't know. Because you're never going to get to number four if you don't start with number one. You're never going to get to number four if you don't have a number two. But the fourth thing is to get help. Get help. You know, that gambling get help number that was advertised this morning I have an idea that the person who'd finally then call that number and get the help is going to do far better than the person who does not. Or maybe to say, too, that the person who goes into that in, inpatient treatment facility for drugs or alcohol addiction probably going to do better than that person who says, I can do it on my own. You see, we need to get help. We need to be sure. Not let things become an idol in our life. Not let evil overtake us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we recognize you as the Almighty in our dependence, our need for you. Thankful for every blessing you bring our way. This morning we're mindful of addiction and its destruction on lives, on families, and that there are all sorts of addictions, and that addiction would be so commonplace. When you started adding all the kinds of addictions that people could have, how commonplace they would be in our country. But Father, we pray that we would seek to live the Christian life and you know, never start what could become the addiction. So 
we never get on that road and never arrive at that destination. But we pray, too, that if there is a struggle in our own life, that we would be determined, I'm not going to continue anymore. I'm going to admit it, repent of it, get the help I need, because I want to overcome it. Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace, and the help you give us. We thank you for your promise of forgiveness. But then we also ask that you would help each of us that as we might know somebody that is addicted, not to be the enabler, but to do our best to, kind of like Carol O'Connor said, get between them and that problem so that they don't become that statistic and that victim. Father, we pray that we would not be sympathetic with evil, but that we would have a compassionate heart for those people who've been overcome of these evil things, loving them, caring for them, and desiring that they get back on the right path and the right road. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we close, if we could assist you in your obedience this morning, if with a determination, I believe, I've turned from my sin, we could assist you as you, and give you that opportunity to confess your faith and assist you in baptism for the remission of sins. If there's a need for prayer, we'd be glad to take this time and pray for you. If you need to come, please come as we stand.